Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. Today I have the enormous privilege of speaking to my good friend and fellow ex-Jehovah's Witness, Dave Gracie. Welcome, Dave. Hello. Thank you, Lloyd. Good to be here. It's wonderful to have you on the channel. We were just saying off camera that it's been two years since I had the pleasure of visiting you in person as part of the project for the Truth About the Truth documentary, and we did some filming um, at your home, your beautiful home in Utah. Um, it's nice to be catching up again. It is. It's exciting. It's good to see you, and uh, a lot has been going on in the meantime, and hopefully we can uh, you know, get into a lot of that today. An awful lot has been going on. Your story is... Well, the reason why we came to speak to you in the first place was because your story and what your family has been through is just extraordinary. And so it felt right to uh, revisit this for the channel and obviously that way bring things a bit more up to date than what we were able to discuss uh, two years ago. So uh, talk us through how you first became involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm a, actually a... Uh third generation Jehovah's Witness. My great grandparents on my mother's side were Bible students. And uh, my, my mother's father also became a Bible student, although he died quite early in 1929. Um, my mother was born in 1913, baptized in 1942. She was at the uh, International Assembly in Columbus, Ohio in 31, where they adopted the name Jehovah's Witnesses as a young woman. Um, I was born in 1948. Uh, my father was a non-believer, but he never, he never gave my mother any trouble. He was, anything she wanted was fine. Um, uh, I was baptized in 1962 at 14 years of age. And uh, I was a true believing Jehovah's Witness for most of my life. Um, I graduated high school in 1966 and started pioneering the next month after graduation in 1966 in July. How many um, hours was it back then? Can you remember? It was 100 hours, Wow! believe it or not. <laughs> 100 hours per month of free labor for right. recruiting for the 100 magazines, seven books. Uh, at least they wanted you to have seven Bible studies. Oh, so they targeted you on, on what you did using that 100 hours as well, did they? Oh, yes. Oh, oh right. yes. Okay. Yes, they targeted you big time. <laughs> and uh, actually, I got up to nine Bible studies at one time. <laughs> wow. Did any of them progress? I say, yes. I say uh, progress. We're using JW lingo yeah. at the moment, aren't we? But well, yeah. There was two of them that progressed, uh, both to baptism. One actually went to Bethel and um, became a, an elder later on. I've lost, lost touch with him, but uh, he actually had a, uh, a scholarship to the Air Force Academy and canceled that scholarship to become a Jehovah's Witness. I met him in the door-to-door -door work. Wow. So you were really in the thick of it by the sound. I was. Of I was. I was I'm a good at what you were doing. At 18 years. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were good at what you were doing. You were. I loved it. Things. Believe it yeah. or not, I enjoyed it. Um, that's why I made such a good salesman later in life. <laughs> 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 so um, I was a ministerial servant at 18. Uh, at uh, 23, they tried to appoint me as an elder, but the Watchtower Society said, he needs to wait a bit. Um, at 25, I became an elder. That was 1974. Um, in those days, they had what was called the rotation. You became, you, you entered in and you were like a watchtower study conductor or something. And then every year it rotated. You moved it to a different, until you became a different position, until you became a uh, at the next year, there were so many rotations because one elder was removed, one elder mo moved, and another died, that I was presiding overseer after one year as an elder in 1975. <laughs> At the age of 26. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard, 
in the back of my mind, 25 is like the absolute youngest. I'm right. not personally aware of anyone. I, I have a relative who was appointed at the age of 25. So that's stuck in my mind as, as the youngest you can be appointed as an elder. So you were clearly doing everything right from the organization's perspective. Yes. Um, one thing, if you don't mind, I would really like to uh, just touch on is, you know, in the time scale here, you're talking about becoming an elder um, just a year before the world was supposed to end. I know. So the organization uh, now suggests that it was all a figment of our imagination and actually it was just one or two who, who ran ahead and got, got too excited um, about dates. Uh, was it all about the individual publishers? Were they to blame or was it the organization that was pushing 1975? Well, it wasn't individual publishers, I will tell you that. The circuit overseers stirred up the pot big time. Every time a circuit overseer would come and visit you, he would announce, well, brothers, there's only 18 months till 1975. Do you have your affairs in order? Are you ready? Are you pioneering? Are you thinking about downsizing? It was a constant drumbeat, constant from the society. Hmm. The talks at the circuit assemblies were all about 75. The kingdom ministries were all about 1975. Everything was about 1975. It was a huge uh, push by the Watchtower Society to get people to do more. They really believed that the world was going to not end, but change significantly uh, in that year. And it was reflected in the material that you were given and the talks that were given. Totally, totally reflected in that. That was the case. There was, it was not just publisher's ideas. I can guarantee you that. I lived through it as an elder. So having been an elder through 1975, um, what was the reaction, first of all, from you to the failure of the prophecy, but also presumably there would have been members of your congregation coming up to you saying, Dave, what on earth's going on? Uh, there was a few publishers that I knew that actually sold their homes and moved to South America, Central America, to serve where the need was great, who returned shortly after 1975, very discouraged and disappointed and angry. And I know of one family that left the organization at that time. There was a lot of talk about what happened, what's going on, but the Watchtower Society just continued to promote the fact that brothers, we may have something a little wrong here, they didn't actually say that, but the uh, narrative was be patient, don't, don't run ahead of things. And, uh, but that wore thin after a while. They seemed to latch on to the idea that um, 6,000 6, years of human existence was probably not met with Adam's creation, but with Eve's yes. creation. Yes. And so, that may have affected the timeline. And that we don't know how many while. years between Adam's creation and Eve being formed out of a rib it was. And that might account for the deviation for, for Armageddon not, not arriving on 1975. Yeah. We grabbed onto it because it was the only thing we had. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. And obviously, this was a very interesting period from the point of view of um, Jehovah's Witness history. And I know what I know about it. I've basically had to read about because I was born in 1979 and uh, a lot of this stuff kind of predated me, but uh, were you cognizant at all of the um, 1980 purge of apostates that uh, ejected uh, Ray Franz from the governing body? I, I resigned as an elder in 1981. I had three small children at the time. My wife was overwhelmed. I was working, commuting to work in Los Angeles and didn't get home till late at night and then ran right to the meeting. So I was so absorbed in my family affairs at the time. Um, I, we became aware of it kind of after the fact. And um, there was some talk of that, but it wasn't a big deal. Mm. Yeah, I suppose 
I suppose it's the sort of thing where you could have conceivably been kept completely in the dark, even if you were living through that period. Because in, you know, pre-internet, it was easier to keep that sort of thing under wraps, wasn't it? You know, it was. And once again, with a young family uh, and uh, trying to support myself by working a lot, I worked a second job as well and tried to still uh, meet the hour requirement. I wasn't a pioneer at that time. I stopped pioneering in 1973, shortly after the birth of my first child, Laura. Sure. So you resigned as an elder in 1981. Was that mostly to do with, you know, like you say, the, the logistics and, you know, your, your, you know, the business of your life and that kind of thing? It was. And uh, my, my first wife was, like I say, overwhelmed. And it, it was a matter of survival at that time. I was very concerned about her welfare. Um, and... Uh, I'm not going to go any deeper than that, but mm. uh, she was she was very troubled about re- doing everything herself and trying to work her own job and have the kids in daycare. So it was mm. it was okay. stressful. Sure. And so, you know, how did how did you manage to adapt? Um, how did you get through this kind of stressful period? Well, it it lasted for a while. We actually bought a home and moved away from the congregation we were in in Orange County, California. And um, that's when things became very stressful because we had to commute a long distance to work, both of us. And uh, at that particular time, my wife and I broke up. And uh, the marriage was on edge and she had taken the kids and moved away to another home and so in order to get our family back together we decided we were going to have to leave the area and um, take the kids and move them to another location and so we moved to northern california and at the time my wife had just been disfellowshipped and so we moved into a new congregation in northern california and it was The first meeting we went to was announced that my wife had been disfellowshipped. So that soured our relationship with that congregation uh, irrevocably. We were there in Northern California for about five years. And uh, the family decided to move to Utah, where we are now. My brother was an elder in the congregation in Utah. He had been a special pioneer. And... uh, we were able to buy a house finally. And so that sent us to Utah and things were okay for a while, but um, I was reappointed as an elder in the early nineties. And uh, my family broke up again. And uh, the children were older then and one one had uh, moved out and got married, my son, John. And uh, we, um, we divorced. My oldest had left. And so I was uh, alone with my, my youngest daughter, Brianna. And uh, so the family was just totally shattered. And it, it was, my wife had been unfaithful twice. So that was the, that was the cause of the stress. Right. So it sounds as though there'd been problems more or less throughout the marriage and things finally reached a point where it wasn't going to work. Uh, it wasn't. I, I've obviously never been in that situation myself, but I, I understand it's one of the most stressful things that can happen to a person when when a marriage uh, ends in divorce. It could be a very stressful thing to go through. Especially for 26 years. Yeah. You were married for 26 years. Shortly after that time, uh, uh, I met and, and uh, married Miju in uh, in two thousand in nineteen ninety eight, and um, I became stepdad to her two girls, Ria and Elisa. They were five and seven, and uh, within a year after um, I had resigned as I had been removed as an elder shortly before our divorce. And uh, they reappointed me shortly after Miju and I got married. And 
I was reappointed in 1999. And uh, the marriage with Miju has been very good. It's been a very good thing for my family, for myself, and for her family. So I've had the uh, pleasure of meeting her. She's a force to be reckoned with, isn't she? Uh, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> she may be tiny, but uh, do not underestimate that woman. <laughs> <laughs> Climbing mountains all over Utah is my memory. Uh, she is. She is. She's a, she's an avid mountain climber. I mean, she climbs 14,000 foot mountains. Mm, indeed. Not to be trifled with. No. Uh, so, okay. So this was a fresh start. Uh, and you were an elder when you were married. So you met Miju through the religion. Right. We were in the same congregation together. Uh, and uh, I always admired Miju, but I never looked at her as anything but a sister in the congregation. Um, so I met her outside of that uh, setting when she came to my office to talk to my brother about selling a, a car for another brother who was Korean and didn't speak English. And so I met her, but I saw her in a different light, and I, I was taken by her, I'll have to tell you. Um, Shortly after that, uh, we started dating, and uh, within six months, we were married. Very quickly, but, you know, I was in my late 40s at the time. She was in her 30s, and so it's not like it's something we didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's like I say, it was a totally different kind of a person, different culture, um, a different person than my first wife, totally. Um, Do you feel that, that in hindsight, it's possible that, you know, you were better equipped to go into a marriage how, now that you were both adults, whereas, you know, in your in your first marriage, you would have been very young, wouldn't you, and, and inexperienced and perhaps not knowing who you were as a person. Um, and obviously, with all of the sexual repression surrounding life as a young Jehovah's Witness. There, there are pressures there to commit to a relationship um, before you even really know who you are or what you want as, as, a, as a person. Do you think that might factor into the relative success of your second marriage? You hit the nail right on the head, Lloyd. I was 21. We had been dating for several years. She was just 18 when we got married. And um, you nailed it. That's exactly what the, the situation was. Um, so it uh, it was a poor choice, although I totally treasure my three children from that marriage. I don't regret the marriage at all. Yeah, I learned a lot. And uh, it was a part of my life that, uh, you know, is makes, who, you makes me who I am. Yeah. Okay. And Presumably, it was in this second marriage um, that you started to kind of start to see behind the curtain or you started to notice that something might not be right in, in the religion that you devoted by this point decades to. The wheel started to come off, yes. Mm. Um, not right away. Uh, I was very happy as an elder. I had some very good friends. And... Um, but as my as my stepchildren aged, uh, you know, they got to associate more with um, other kids in the congregation. And uh, one of my uh, one of my oldest stepdaughter's friends, um, unbeknownst to us, started to develop a relationship with my youngest stepdaughter, Rhea. And behind our backs, he was. We lived in a house that was three stories on the side of a hill. And so he, he's come, he came and snuck in the back door of the bottom floor to see Rhea. She would let him in. Mm. And that's when the inappropriate relationship began with that young man. And um, it turned into a where he can with, repeatedly rape her at night. In your own home in my own home. We lived on the top floor mm. and we were totally unaware of this. We became Just unaware because of the physics of the building and the way it was laid out and everything. He, he'd managed to orchestrate a way of getting into your house without you even knowing that he was there. And presumably was there some kind of manipulation going on here because 
you know, with, with the way he was coercing your daughter to let him in? I don't know. I mean, well, sometimes he would knock at her window because it was right. on the side of a hill and, and you could just walk right through the window into her bedroom. Right. And uh, she was kind of flattered at first, but when it turned sour, um, the relationship broke up, but the bickering back and forth between them apparently went online on through emails. And uh, I got a visit from this young man's mother at work wondering why my daughter was slandering her son via email. So um, I, I had no idea if there was anything going on. So I, uh, I, we confronted Rhea and that's when the story come falling out that she had been raped repeatedly over a several month period by this young man. And our first response was let's call the elders. So uh, we called the presiding overseer, who was my best friend at the time. He came and heard the story and says, Dave, I think this needs to be, the, the police need to be notified of this. He says, if you won't call the police, I will. I says, no, I'm going to call the police. So I credit him for that. And um, the police came and took a report. And shortly thereafter, he contacted the congregation this young man was in. And uh, that young man was disfellowshipped almost immediately. Um, and then began uh, a back and forth between ourselves and the police department because we wanted them to charge him with rape. He was 18 at the time and she was 14, and then later turned 15 shortly thereafter, but still underage mm. and below the age of consent. The police refused to do anything about it. Um, and then the elders did something very strange. They seemed to think that Rhea was a willing participant. And so they questioned her with us in, at the home, with us uh, present, for, for two sessions of two hours each to try to get her to cop to the fact that it wasn't a rape. And she refused that. She refused to admit that. So they felt like they couldn't do anything judicially. I don't know why they thought they had to do something judicially, but they did. So what one of the elders did was he called this young man's mother and said, and he couldn't talk to him personally because he was disfellowshipped. And so he asked her, does your son have any evidence that this sexual relationship was consensual? So she asked him, he says, well, I have an audio tape of one of the sessions. Oh, my. Which immediately tells you that something very twisted was happening. Um, if he was actually, for salacious reason, reasons, recording this whole thing, he was taking along a, a recording device and setting it up. Horrible. It's just, a, mm. just hard to imagine. What's even harder to imagine is they obtained the tape and listened to it repeatedly and then decided that it was proof of her being consensual. So we were called to a judicial meeting Sunday night after a meeting, after they had repeatedly listened to this. And of course I, had, I knew nothing about this. We knew nothing about this at all. And they said, we have proof that Rhea was a willing participant. You need to show up at this judicial meeting and you need to keep quiet when this meeting is going on because we're going to reveal this. I had, we had no idea what this was all about. Mm. What we were concerned about at the time was our daughter, our 15 year old daughter by then being disfellowshipped and the trauma that would impose upon her. Rhea was a very pri is a very private person. Um, and we were worried about it. So when they started the meeting, they asked her, do you have anything you want to tell us? And of course she says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. She didn't even realize that she was being taped in this sexual encounter. She had no idea. And it would have been a traumatizing discovery to find out that she had been. Yes. For perverse reasons recorded. Yeah. So this very private young woman at 15 years of age, they start to play this tape and she just explodes in tears. 
She is devastated. She is screaming to shut it off, shut it off, shut it off. And they won't do that. They play the tape and continue to play the tape. We stopped the interrogation a couple of times to get her to get her composure. And she was just a she was destroyed. She was rocking back and forth, crying and screaming, please, 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 please. Now this went on for a total of five hours, Lloyd. Five hours. Somewhere in the tape, the elders got the idea that he had taken pictures of her. And so what they tried to do was tell her that doing a police interrogation, they say, we have seen the pictures and they're not pretty. So they, she thought they had seen pictures of her without her clothes on, being raped. And that just drove her completely off the scale. I mean, it's, it's impossible to put yourself in that scenario. Um, it's, it, it's just an, an unimaginably traumatizing situation to be in. But one would imagine it would be made even more traumatizing if, in effect, the elders and even the, your parents become spectators to the rape because the recording is then being played in front of them. So you're, you're effectively being raped in front of all of these people. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. how she felt. Right. It's exactly how she felt. Now, one of my greatest regrets is we didn't stop this meeting, but as a longtime elder and a lifelong Jehovah's witness, I didn't think we could. I had no, I thought she'd be disfellowshipped immediately. Hmm. Our goal was to, prevent her from being disfellowshipped. So eventually uh, I talked to Rhea outside the meeting and I said, you know, the only way to get this to end, and I wished I had thought this through better, but I didn't. The only way to get this to end is just to say, hey, look, okay, you know, do whatever you gotta do. I did it, you know, cause they're, it was going to continue. And by this time, it had been going on for almost five hours. Five hours of mentally and emotionally raping my, my dear little stepdaughter. Mm. Michu was there, too. She was crying as well. And so she was eventually disfellowshipped. And she went into a deep depression deep depression. She, we, we had, we, we, we got her some help. We went to psychologists. We, we got her help immediately. She was uh, suicidal. She was just beside herself. She was just an emotional wreck. 15 year old girl. So, um, me, me, you tried to get the elders to, because one of the elders was a counselor. She tried to get him to talk to her and, and, and help her. He wasn't in the judicial meeting. There were four elders, by the way, in that judicial meeting. Mm. So eventually, Miji was trying to get help for her daughter. They marked her. Eventually. They marked um, Miju. Marked Miju because she wouldn't give, I and mean, she was trying to get the elders to reconsider. She was trying to get the elders to help provide her with some help to talk to her, but they refused. I should just explain because about 40% of my viewers have never been Jehovah's witnesses and don't know all the, all the lingo. So marking is kind of a, a soft form of shunning where you are still expected to attend the meetings and even do the preaching work. And you can be spoken to in that context but you're not allowed, no one's allowed to associate with you outside of the meetings or right. ministry. So it's like a, um, an intermediary stage of shunning. Yeah. Well, exactly. What finally happened was uh, we got called in. We, we were at a meeting with Rhea and Elisa and me, Joe and myself. And Rhea and Elisa were talking to each other at the meeting. Now they're sisters, hmm. blood sisters. 
And so we were called into a meeting after the meeting and Elisa was counseled in front of us about talking to a disfellowship person at the kingdom hall. And we said, she's their sisters. What are you talking about? Yeah. And so this caused Elisa a great deal of stress. She was embarrassed. She was angry. My wife was furious. So what we did was from then on, our goal was still to get Rhea back in the organization. Rhea and I attended meetings in one congregation so she could get reinstated. And Lisa and her mother attended meetings in a neighboring congregation so they didn't have to put up with all this. So that kind of spread the story a little bit about why are they they going into different congregations? (laughs) A former elder. And by the way, Miju was a 16-year pioneer at that time. Knowing what I know about elders and how controlling they tend to be, and especially given what we already have learned about the elders in this particular uh, area, I'm guessing that they they will have seen quite a bit of strategizing going on here, and that probably will not have gone down well, the fact that you were trying to circumnavigate almost their disciplinary efforts. Yeah, I suppose so. Mm. So... um, The next step in the evolution of this was shortly after she was disfellowshipped, um, I was removed as an elder, obviously. And I was removed not because of the fact that she was disfellowshipped, but because I had written a half a dozen letters to the Watchtower Society complaining about the action and and copied these same letters to the elders in the congregation. I was quoting Watchtower publications, telling them, how can you disfellowship a 14-year-old girl for mm. being raped. That's below the age of consent. I even showed Watchtower articles where she said that, you know, there's no rape when they're not at the age of consent, they're a child. And when the circuit overseer came around shortly after she was disfellowshipped, they removed me because I wrote all those letters. I was furious with the elders and with the Watchtower Society. And the circuit overseer told me, if you hadn't written all those letters to the society, you wouldn't be removed. I said, well, you know what? I threw my book on the table and I says, you can remove, I'm not going to quit. You're going to have to remove me. Mm. And so they said, okay, we're going to remove. So they gave you an option of stopping writing the letters. Yes. Wow. And I said, no, it's wrong. Stop (laughs) writing letters or we'll remove you. Okay. (laughs) Well, can I just, again, clarify, because there's going to be a lot of viewers watching this, especially those who've never been Jehovah's Witnesses, who will be, I mean, even those who've been Jehovah's Witnesses will be aghast at this story. I know I am, or or was when I first heard it uh, two years ago, but I just think it's important to stress that when you're in this situation, it really does feel as though there is no other way out because this is your universe. All you know is being a Jehovah's Witness. All you know about sin or um, or matters involving wrongdoing is dealing with it through the elders. And um, I should also point out that in the elders' manual, in the child abuse section, it twice, I think, uses the phrase willing participant and recently in the montana case um there's been uh, a document has been brought to light which is part of the organization's database which it keeps where it keeps details of thousands of predators and it it maintains this uh this data on on these instances of abuse and in the form where the organization is keeping record of these instances, it also includes a part on was the person, was the child a willing participant? I know that phrase just infuriates me. So you were railing against this. You were saying this is not okay. Um, Presumably trying to appeal to them based on their own publications. But were you aware, or you must have been aware as an elder, that they do actually consider um, abuse victims, even children, to be willing participants. Sadly. Sadly. So we worked at getting Rhea reinstated. Uh, so we waited a year. 
she 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 didn't want to get reinstated. She was so upset. She knew that she thought she would have to go through listening to that tape all over again to be reinstated. We told her that wasn't the case, but we forced her to write a letter. She she wrote the letter. We went through a judicial meeting. They reinstated her. It was painful, but it wasn't nearly as painful as the first time. Mm. When the, she was announced as reinstated, that same, the next night, the next meeting, we changed congregations. And we just all picked up and moved. We didn't move our residence, but we just started attending a neighboring congregation. Because I wasn't, we weren't, I didn't want to see those people again. Neither did Miju or Rhea or anybody. Mm. That created some stress as well because they were totally aware of the situation. The elders had communicated with them. I mean, I knew this congregation very well. I'd given dozens of talks there. I knew everybody uh, very well. And so uh, we were in that congregation for uh, about two years. And um, that was, we, we, changed over to that congregation in uh, 2009. Um, in uh, 2000, um, late 2009, shortly after this, Miju went to Child Protective Services and reported this case to them. They didn't want to do anything about it. But like you said, Miju was a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. She got them to do something about it. They looked into this. They actually called the elders in to a meeting with their paralegal, and they were interviewed. They made a finding that the elders were guilty of child maltreatment. The Watchtower Society did not represent them in this meeting. They kind of said, whoa, you know. Threw them under the bus. <laughs> right. So right. the elders appealed this, this ruling. Then it went to administrative court to hear the appeal. Now, let me just kind of cut a fine timeline here. This is the end of 2009. There's going to be a hearing in early 2010 to consider their appeal, and they asked me to testify. January 10th. Two thousand ten. <laughs> My oldest Sorry. daughter yeah. in California had a meeting with elders. She killed herself after that meeting. I'm sorry, Dave. It's the worst possible thing that can happen to a parent. <clears throat> Apparently, <clears throat> they had a meeting at her house, <coughs> and <clears throat> she took an overdose of pills <clears throat> that night. I had just been to see her a couple of days prior to that and visited with her. She had just been reinstated for being disfellowshipped the second time. She never got baptized until she was in her mid-30s early thirties. Mm. She was 37 at the time she took the pills. Um, at the funeral, I talked to an elderly sister who lived in the same complex with my daughter and was kind of looking after her. My daughter was taking medication for schizophrenia and uh, I wrote about this in Open Minds Foundation. This whole story is there. But apparently she was scheduled to uh, go in service with this sister that Saturday morning. This meeting was Friday night. She walked by her apartment and she didn't answer the door. She could look in on the kitchen floor in the window and she saw my daughter laying there on the floor, sprawled out with food all over the floor. This dear older sister 
moved on and went to service. She came home that day that my daughter was still on the floor. Sunday morning, she was due to pick her up for meeting. She knocked on the door. There was no answer. My daughter was still laying on the floor Sunday morning. She came home from meeting. She was still on the floor laying there. Monday morning, they looked in on her. My daughter was still on the floor, passed out. Monday afternoon, they called the police who came, called paramedics. This was five o'clock in the afternoon. She was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. Why did it take them so long to, what, what did they think would happen if they left her in that situation? Lloyd, I have no clue. I have no clue. When they, when they told you this, as her father, what, I mean, if, if, if I'd learned this and they were telling me this as though it was perfectly fine, that there would be a scene, you know? We um, were in a setting where it was the, a little meal after the funeral and there was a bunch of people gathered there telling, and this, the elders didn't tell me this, this older sister told me this. Right. And as soon as I heard the story, we got up and walked out. I had tried to talk to the elders about why they had talked to her and they wouldn't tell me. I was in shock. I was beyond grief stricken. Yeah. I was already in shock anyway. Mm. Um, When Jehovah's Witnesses tell you they're a loving organization, these two incidences with my stepdaughter and my daughter helped me to understand that there is no real love in Jehovah's organization. Mm. That no, no real fellow feeling, no real love. It's all on the surface. It's based on who you are and what you do. So this is early 2010. In, in, in uh, March of 2010, after this couple months after the funeral, they have the meeting back in Utah of the, the hearing at administrative court. Administrative court takes two months. This hearing actually was back in February, but they take two months. And then uh, on Memorial night, we didn't obviously go to Memorial. We were, I wasn't going to Memorial at that point. Hmm. They announced, the court announced that they reaffirmed the ruling that elders were guilty of child maltreatment. Then the process begins of people finding out about this. There were some people we were close to that we told because one of the nurses at the center where Rhea saw help and counseling was a Jehovah's Witness and she had friends all over the congregation and this kind of spread like wildfire. So they were going to get us at this point. Wasn't she professionally under a duty of confidentiality? She was not a nurse in the treatment. She was a nurse at the, at the center. Right. Even so, that's dodgy, isn't it, to be using well, your profession to glean information for the organization spent anyway. <laughs> We're talking about an organization that leaves people stricken on the floor in need of help. So, yes, yeah, no love. We weren't terribly upset about her talking about it because right. – yeah, I mean, it caused a stir and, you know, any embarrassment to the elders at that point was a plus as far as we were concerned. Mm. Well, so it started as a several months long process where they tried to gain uh, witnesses against us and in talking against the elders. They managed to scrabble together a couple of people who thought they heard something and testified against us at a judicial meeting. We were just fellowshipped in the fall of that year for speaking against the elders. We appealed it. The appeal came back. Obviously, they upheld it. So we appealed to Brooklyn. 
I didn't know you could do that, but you can, and we did. They sent a circuit overseer, a new circuit overseer to review the case. Of course, they didn't talk to us. And I, I actually called the circuit overseer and I says, you need to talk to us. We have a story to tell too. It's not just what the elders tell you. Mm. He wouldn't talk to me. He says, I can't do that. So in early 2011, February 1st, I think it was, we got a letter from the Watchtower Society confirming the ruling of the elders. We were disfellowshipped. We, we realized that was coming. It wasn't a big shock at that point. So that started the process of us trying to get back. Believe it or not, we still want to come back into this organization. Can you imagine that? I, at this point in my life, I can't imagine I would ever want to do that. Can I just, sorry, the way my mind works, can I just take you back to the uh, hearing uh, for the Child Protective Services? Um, you were giving, presumably, testimony in that hearing. Actually, well, Lloyd, I, I got it. I got it. I left something out here. Right, please. They, did, they, they said, okay, Mr. Gracie, you don't have to do this testifying. Mm. Your wife is going to testify. Mm. And so Miju testified. I wasn't permitted in the room. All oh, right, okay. But Miju testified. And that's the worst thing that ever happened to the elders because she absolutely shredded them into pieces. Right. Again, with her testimony you reckoned with. Yeah. Yes. And so, I mean, th that was the worst thing that could happen to us. <laughs> yeah. So, so she, she unloaded and absolutely. Uh, okay. So, and, and of course, I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to explain the way this works for those who've ne not been in this situation. Um, this is, supposed to reflect on you because you're supposed to be in control of your wife aren't you you're supposed to be <laughs> her spiritual head so if she's laying into the elders in uh in a hearing in an abuse hearing they're going to be holding that against you for not controlling her basically yeah yeah fine <laughs> <laughs> okay well i'm glad we've cleared that up so you amazingly after all of this and after, you know, after so much evidence that this is an abusive group, you still want back in. So talk us through that. Okay. Well, it, it kind of moves pretty quickly from here on. Okay. Okay. So, so we started attending meetings in this other congregation, and we've been attending here. So we, um, we attend for uh, a year. And Miju says, I'm not going to apply for reinstatement. I says, well, I am because... I want to be able to have a relationship with my granddaughters in California, my son's girls, because they were kind of soft shunning me at that time. So I tried to get reinstated. They turned me down. Miju says, I'm not going back to there. So apparently what she had done, we had been going to the meetings and they wouldn't give us a watchtower because they said we didn't have enough. So they said to Miju, you can go online and get a copy of the watchtower and print it out on your printer. Just go to the watchtower's website. Here's what interestingly happened. <laughs> she Googled watchtower. And the first thing that came up on watchtower, and you, I know you know this website, jehovahswitness.net. Yeah. Yeah. And so she clicked on that and all of a sudden realized it's apostate. And so she says, well, how bad can it be? Look what the elders did to our family. <laughs> I'm going to find out if, what this is going on. Mm. So she gets hooked on jehovahswitness.net. So just to clarify for the viewers, this is a forum that, um, this is actually the same forum that I made my first forays as, as the next Jehovah's Witness when I right. was first waking up. And it's now known as, I think Jehovah's witness.com. So it's right. changed. Yeah. Okay. Right. But it, it became known in shorthand as JWN or Je Jehovah's witness.net. So precisely. Yeah. yeah, precisely. So she's, she's on this all the time. And especially just one with, more thing. Sorry. I can't personally recommend it by the way, as a place yeah. to go to, but I, I, I understand the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this first year at meeting, She's on her phone on jehovahswitness.net listening to apostate stuff or reading apostate stuff the whole time. 
So by the end of that first year, she's pretty much awake. Mm. So what she does at the end of that first year is she remembers there was a local apostate in our area. His name is Dan Draney, very notorious local apostate. My brother actually disfellowshipped him when he was an elder years ago. And he, she had called on his house once in error, didn't know he was there, didn't know. And, you know, he tried to get her to read Crisis of Conscience. And she says, oh, no, I can't read that. So after that first year, she remembers where he lives. She goes to his house, knocks on the door, and he says, I'll have oh. that book now, please. <laughs> it's exactly what she said. <laughs> That's exactly what she said. Yeah. And he says, oh, sure. So she starts reading it. And she's, she's reading it to me a little bit here and there, and I'm kind of horrified, but I listen, you know. And uh, so at the end of that first year, she decides that she's not going back to meetings. She's reading this book, and she finds out on JehovahsWitness.net that there's what's called an apostafest in Lake Tahoe, California. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, but, yeah. So she decides she's going and wants me to come. Well, it's in the summer, and that's when the circuit district assembly is. And I said, well, look, I, I need still trying to get up reinstated. I need to be there and be seen. She says, well, I'm going anyway. So she makes her arrangements. She contacts one of these local apostates on JW.N. He's going to pick her up at the airport. She got, she got a room at, in, in, in Tahoe, and uh, she goes, and she has a blast. Okay, she comes back and tells me all about it. While she was there, I read Crisis of Conscience and two other apostate books because she had told me, I don't know if we can stay married if you're going to stay a Jehovah's Witness. Wow. Okay. So that kicked me in the backside. By the time she gets back, I have ordered a half a dozen books off Amazon to read. So I dive into all of them by that time. By the end of 2012, I am fully awake. My wife kicked me in the butt, and that's what really made the difference. Mm. I mean, I, but it all fell into place at that point because I had all this experience with all these things that had gone on from back in 1975 to the generations to all the things that happened with Rhea to things that happened with my daughter. And so I'm fully awake. Uh, I, I tried one more time to get reinstated. They turned me down. I said, March 1st, 2013, when they turned me down, I walked out of the kingdom hall and made a hand gesture to the back of the door as I walked out. <laughs> and that was it. I, I was awake. I was done. I'm over. You, you weren't simply waving, I assume. It was no, a, it was not. Well, it was, it was a, a rude it was a hand gesture. Wave. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a long story short but that's how i woke up wow wow just uh, an incredible story and um you know that there's there's a lot of pain there and a lot of trauma and i, I can imagine it's something that never leaves you as a father it doesn't and um obviously in the case of Rhea, you know, you've you that situation in a in a way is sort of ongoing because you've you, we had, didn't we, last year uh, a Supreme Court hearing. Um are you able to, to tell us about the case and, sure. and where you're up to? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh Rhea contact well, Miju contacted shortly after all this happened. She contacted the Zalkin Law Firm in San Diego. And they, they assigned an investigator to the case who interviewed all sorts of people involved, including uh, the, uh, the rapist. And they put together a, a finding that this is something that they would like to take on as a case. Uh, they originally signed uh, a, an agreement to represent Rhea, and she was a minor at the time. So Miju and I, uh, you know, they, they, we were handling the case because she was a minor. As soon as she turned uh, uh, of age at 18, she took over the case. Uh, the case went to uh, a, a superior court local judge in Ogden, Utah, 
who the Watchtower Society uh, had a local representative uh, attorney, and they um, they dismissed the case because the Watchtower Society petitioned for a dismissal because it conflicted with First Amendment uh, protection, ac according to them. Uh, Zoffin appealed, and it went to uh, Utah Appeals Court, who um, took their sweet time and also ruled that it uh, they would just upheld the dismissal of the case. Uh, Zoffin Law Firm then appealed to the Utah Supreme Court, and uh, Georgetown Law actually agreed to help the case, and they argued the case in Utah Supreme Court last November. And that that uh, that court case is available online. You can listen to it. I think I, think I, I was, was watching, watching some of it, of it um, before today's interview, and I will be putting a link in the description because uh, it's quite fascinating to see um, the organization has a uh, presence to represent them. Um, what's, the, what's her name? Is it Cara Porter? Um, yeah. So they had like a, a, a female lawyer representing them right. um, in <laughs> trying to explain how this is all perfectly normal that elders will <laughs> subject a rape victim to um, hours of recording of, of their of their rape. Uh, quite, sh you know, how do you live with yourself? As, <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to do that as an elder, but uh, uh, you know, <laughs> when when you are in that kind of sphere of of power and getting off on this idea that you can do whatever the hell you like in these incredibly uh, intimate and complex situations, that's one thing. But as presumably a, an educated uh, grown adult who is also a legal professional, how do you sleep at night after appearing in a Supreme Court hearing and saying, oh, yes, everything here is totally above board and nothing should be done about it? Well, interesting, this Kara Porter, Lloyd, uh, in one of the earlier hearings, uh, I believe it was in uh, Superior Court, she said, wait till I get her under cross-examination. She'll, I'll find out what really happened. That's what she said. Oh, Rhea grief. was in the, in the audience at that time. And it absolutely just, she just burst into tears and ran out of the courtroom Good, because grief. she was so triggered by that. Mm. It triggered her right back to what the elders did to her in their interrogation. She felt if she would had to go through this with that Kara Porter, it 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 reinforced in her her desire to move forward with this case and get vindicated. Mm. What what a re-traumatizing thing to say. Horrible to thing to say. Abuse. Horrible Basically. thing to say. So yes, a link will be uh, in the description. And as I understand it, we're waiting on. Um, are we waiting on a verdict that could indeed? Um, coincide with the release of this interview it's, it's supposed to be soon is it it's supposed to be soon now the um the ruling is going to be whether or not the original case could be heard in superior court that's the ruling mm. is it okay to or are they going to go along with the um appeals court and deny the motion you know uphold the motion by the watchtower lawyer now, Zalkin has indicated to us that regardless of what's going to happen, they're going to move on, whether mm. it's to another court or uh, to, a, you know, a, a United a States court. Supreme Court. Eventually. Wow. Eventually. Uh, and so that's that's what they are. They, they've agreed to be in this for the long haul. Brilliant. Brilliant. So they've been very supportive. The Zalkin law firm is been so caring and understanding. They're just, uh, they're wonderful people. I mean, they have treated Rhea with such great respect and honor that uh, I, I would, I, I, you know, I, I just think they're wonderful. I've had Owen uh, on the channel as a panelist for Watch Time Focus, which is now JW Watch. And he's such a, 
a, a, a generous and um, an astute man. Um, I will be putting a link as well to his uh, law firm if anyone is watching this who is perhaps in need of his services. Um, but wow, I, I can only wish you and Ria the best of luck. And uh, despite yeah. this being such a painful experience to kind of go through again, um, I'm sure you understand that by going through it today with my viewers, you're going to be helping a lot of people to understand just how messed up this organization is. And many people will be relating to what you're saying. I sure hope so. Mm. One of the benefits of all this, if there's any benefit, uh, my son was already awake pretty much. He's fully awake now. My, my other daughter was pretty much awake. Now she's fully awake. Uh, of course, Rhea's older sister is, was long been awake all, all along on during this thing. My youngest granddaughter, who's 19, uh, I, I met with her uh, in 2019 at the Apostle Fest, and she was 17 at the time. And I got a chance to reconnect with her. I hadn't really been able to reconnect with her for, for a number of years. And she told me that the elders came around to her and asked her, why you weren't baptized like your sister, your older sister's baptized. She told them, Lloyd, get this. She said, when you let sisters be elders and sit in on judicial meetings, then I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> they left Brilliant. and then never come back. <laughs> Brilliant. 17. Wow. I don't think that's going to happen somehow. But, I don't uh... think so <laughs> God. Well, uh, that's about all we have time for. Uh, I like to think that we might be continuing this conversation in some form in the future, because I always enjoy our conversations. Obviously, the one that we had previously is part of the documentary, and people will see that at some point. Um, before we go, uh, if anyone is watching this, perhaps as a Jehovah's Witness, or maybe they're on the fence and they're starting to kind of realize that something is not quite right, but they perhaps, you know, uh, lack that little bit of courage to move forward and investigate their beliefs, uh, what would be your advice to them? Number one, don't shun your family ever, because you never know where that's going to lead. Number two is the truth is out there, and that's in the end what really got me, Lloyd, was that I was a true believing Jehovah's Witness. When I learned through painful experience, they're not the truth, it devastated me. But it reinforced in me the need to stand up for the truth. Because the truth, Jesus was right. If there was a Jesus, it, he was right. The truth will set you free. The truth about the truth set me mentally and emotionally free, as well as my wife and my entire family. Even my nephew, my brother's son, in his early 30s now, is totally out because of all this and what he's read. That's my message. Well, who, who knew we would end with a, a Bible quotation, but... <laughs> <laughs> what, what a fitting one and uh, I heartily agree with you those words do apply uh, Dave Gracie you are an inspiration as is Miju I hope I can get Miju on the channel at some point I think our viewers I would love to, to have her on the channel she's her she's side a, of all this uh, <laughs> that would be fun <laughs> Let, let's arrange that uh, okay. but thank, thank you so much for this conversation Dave you've pleasure. been very generous with your time and uh, viewers I hope you've enjoyed this interview. I know I have. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such interviews. And as always, thank you for watching.